let's talk about Ren and Stimpy. Oh boy, this is tough. Taking away the last 10 years or so, I would go as far as to say that there really isn't an animated series that has had more of an impact on me than Ren and Stimpy. The cartoon was the perfect progression from the golden age of cartoons that I had grown up on to that point, and as a kid growing up in the 90s, constantly begging my parents to get Sky TV so I could watch shows like Ren and Stimpy on Nickelodeon. When I was able to catch a glimpse of Ren Hurick, Stimson J Cat, Powdered Toast Man, Muddy Mud Skipper, Mr. Horse, George Licker, American, I was in my absolute element. Sure, I never ended up taking myself down the animation path as originally intended, but I still think it's safe to say that this show, plus many others of course, but in particular this show, had a significant impact on my life. Well, just like when one of your favourite musical artists or actors dies when you finally discover the horrific, sinister, behind the scenes stuff of something that was this important to you growing up, you're not just annoyed or angry, you are genuinely gutted because it feels like a part of you has gone with it. So, for the first time in a while, I'm going to pretend that the last 10 years or so just didn't happen. Poof, they're gone. For now. Don't worry, Kick Scammer fans will get to that part eventually. But right now I've decided to whisk myself back to a simpler time when the intoxicating, disgusting and confusing Ren and Stimpy ruled the imagination of kids everywhere. And you know what? I invite you to pull up a log, take a seat and jump into the orange coloured slime filled time machine with me as we look into everything Ren and Stimpy from its creation, its impact, its cancellation, its reincarnation, its video games and of course, sadly, more recent events too. So, let's jump right in. Hi everybody, I'm DJ Slope from Slope's Game Room and this is Ren and Stimpy, the history and the games. On the Lord of Hero at Nick. On the Lord of Hero at Nick Nick. On the Ricky Dicky Low while living number one Nickelodeon. Born on September 9th, 1955 in Canada, Michael John Christopher Lucy actually spent his early years in Germany and Belgium whilst his father was serving in the Royal Canadian Air Force. This meant that a lot of his weekends, instead of being outside playing with his friends, would actually be spent inside military cinemas. And here we are, straight off the bat. The obsession with animation had already begun as he found himself watching reruns of popular European animated shows and movies. I used to go to the movies every weekend on an Air Force base when I was about two or three years old until I was about seven. Every weekend I'd go to the movies and see these weird cartoons, European feature length cartoons like the Snow Queen. This cushy little life that John had been given quickly and abruptly ended at around the age of seven as the family found themselves moving to Canada. And just as John was adjusting to his new life in Canada with his new friends, he was once again ripped out of school again and ended up being taken to Ottawa to live with his grandparents for a few months, not going to school whilst his parents continued with the move. This was an exceptionally troubling time for John. He felt alone, no doubt betrayed and upset that his new friends were once again taken away from him. And how did he combat this? Why, cartoons of course. Yes, he enjoyed cartoons for as long as he could remember, but now he was becoming obsessed watching more and more every day. It's all I did. I drew cartoons. I watched them. That's when I discovered Huckleberry Hound, Yogi Bear, Quick Draw McGraw, and Beanie and Cecil. John would have himself a Huckleberry Hound bowl and a Yogi Bear cup that he would eat his breakfast from every morning and he would refuse to have it any other way. Eventually his love for drawing these classic Hanna-Barbera cartoons became too hard for John as he found himself buying up as many comics as he possibly could to better perfect the art style that he had grown to love. But perfecting the art styles of some of his favourite animated shows was only half the challenge. Yes, he could draw them, and as the days, weeks and months went on, he became bloody good at doing so. 
but actually getting these little things to move? Well, for a young lad, that proved to be quite the hard task. That was until the day that he finally just figured it out. The first time I actually figured it out was my dad bought me a Huckleberry Hound make your own flip book. I didn't know what a flip book was. I took it home and I opened the box and pulled out all of these long strips of cardboard. On the strips were individual drawings of Huckleberry Hound or Yogi Bear or whoever, all very slightly different. Each drawing was a little bit different from the previous one. I was like, oh, this is weird. And I read the instructions and it said, cut the pictures apart and lay them on top of each other. Pinch the top and then flip them. So I did that and I thought it was crazy. I thought, what a weird thing to do, cut up all these pictures. But I did it, and I flipped it, and I freaked out. I let go of the pictures, and they flew all over the floor. I was like, Eureka! So that's what makes it move. It isn't witchcraft, it's scientifically possible. From that day on, I was an atheist. By this point, I think it goes without saying that cartoons had taken over his life completely. It may have started off as a get whatever he can sort of situation, but by this point, it was very obvious that John had found what he liked the most and was quickly learning not just how to draw like his animation heroes, but also how to animate like them too. And no cartoon director had a bigger impact on him than Bob Clampett, and to be more specific, Bob Clampett's The Great Piggy Bank Robbery. If you go back through this cartoon and actually freeze frame certain shots, you'll see some incredibly bizarre and twisted frames of Daffy Duck that the average Joe would have absolutely no idea how to draw in the first place. There was plenty more that inspired John's style, humour and show, but this is without a doubt the most influential. I saw this thing and it completely changed my life. I thought it was the greatest thing I'd ever seen, and I still think it is. Another big influence on John's life was his own dad, however not in the way you would expect. John's dad was not a fan of his work, being a strict military man, and he tried his best to enforce his what it takes to be a real man beliefs onto his son, which John would constantly fight against. This went so far that after spending an entire summer creating a single comic book, when completed, he showed his dad all super excited like, and his dad just threw it straight on the fire in disgust that his son had wasted an entire summer doodling pictures rather than playing sports or chasing girls. And to push it even further, at the age of about 11 or 12, he ran home from school one day to find a stack of Playboy magazines in his cupboard that his dad had planted in an attempt to get him more interested in the ladies. John only found out that it was him many years later after having drinks with his dad as an adult, but at the time, he, uh, well, let's just say he was frightened to actually own them due to not wanting to get caught with them. But also, at the same time, pretty damn excited. <laughs> Playboy magazines and classic Warner Brother cartoons. Yeah, it's all starting to make sense now, isn't it? Thankfully, this relationship with his dad, as harsh as it may sound, never turned too sour, and John was happy with the relationship, especially when Foghorn Leghorn was on TV, as it was the one cartoon that the two shared a common interest in. John would eventually base cartoons such as Anthony's dad on his own father, he had him voice Ren's old man in Ren Seeks Help, and finally, George Licker, American, was also based on him too. Anyway, after John dropped out of animation college due to not agreeing with their teachings, he finally got himself a couple of jobs at legendary animation companies such as Hanna-Barbera and Deke Entertainment. The only problem here for John was that during this time, the 1970s and 80s, animation had taken a new form. A form that John detested. Everything became generic, bland, simple, and easily produced from obvious scripted scenarios instead of the wacky storyboard-driven golden age of Warner Brother cartoons, and John hated it. A lot of animators hated it to be fair, but John… John was a tad more vocal than the rest, even creating rather explicit comics of the characters that the studio was known for such as a rather sexual Flintstones strip that involves Wilma having sex, and yes, <laughs> these are way too rude for YouTube, as a form of rebellion with his fake name Billy Bunting signing off his work. If you want to see this sort of stuff, it's not too hard to find. 
Anyway, to cut this whole thing down a bit more, John eventually went on to help create plenty more shows for plenty more companies, such as Ted Bakes 1 for Mighty Mouse The New Adventures, and he got to meet his idols such as the previously mentioned Bob Clampett and Milt Gross, who actually became his mentors, which, well, that's pretty awesome. But in regards to John's career, the real first major streak of success came from helping create the Rolling Stones music video Harlem Shuffle. Now, his work was finally getting seen by plenty of fresh new eyes, and a lot of them. This was the Rolling Stones after all. And from this, more shows came and went with varying levels of success such as Beanie and Cecil, The New Adventures, a cartoon show that execs at ABC wanted to be a child-friendly show, but obviously with John Kay at the helm it was anything but. Constant delays and arguments between John and his crew of supported animators and the TV execs resulted in this being yet another quickly cancelled series, which yet again left John all alone. However, by this point he had a very small army of incredibly talented artists beside him that he had vetted and trained into his new ideal style and with that, even though he had no money to do so, John Kay plus a few others, but mostly John Kay, decided to open up their own animation studio called Spumco. Now. Before going ahead, it's probably worth mentioning the inspiration for some of the characters in John's portfolio. As you can imagine, as a cartoonist, he no doubt had hundreds to choose from, but let's narrow it down to just two. Firstly, inspired by Bob Clampett's gruesome twosome, he created, as he calls it, a retarded cat, with a big bulbous nose that would eventually become Stimpy. And after seeing a postcard called New York City 1946 of an ugly looking chihuahua standing next to a very Tom and Jerry s 1940s well dressed housewife, John found the image so hilarious that he decided to make an ugly looking character to go along with it called Wren, who by the way was actually named after John's own landlord. Anyway, he put these two together and pitched them several times along with plenty other cartoons of course, and as always is the case, he got turned down multiple times. Eventually word got out that a new cable station called Nickelodeon was on the lookout for creator driven animated shows, which was already on the rise with such shows as Mighty Mouse and Who Framed Roger Rabbit rising interest in classic animation doing so well in recent years. So John decided to get in touch, as an opportunity like this back in the day was pretty much unheard of. This infamous meeting took place and John brought with him several pitches. You got He Hog, The Atomic Pig, The Predator, Jimmy's Clubhouse, and most notably for this segment, Your Gang. This was a live action show with animated shorts spliced in throughout the show and Ren and Stimpy was just a secondary couple of characters in those episodes. After an extremely exaggerated performance showing off his characters and ideas, the executives at Nickelodeon were overwhelmed with joy at the sheer energy and obvious love for animation that this guy had. Plus, the ideas were pretty funny. The very next day, they made him a couple of offers, one for Jimmy the Idiot Boy and of course another for Ren and Stimpy. However, the contract stated that Nickelodeon would own all of the rights to these characters if he was to go ahead, and not wanting to give him his prize Jimmy the Idiot Boy cartoon, he decided to just let him have Ren and Stimpy instead, and <laughs> well, Ren and Stimpy was finally born. And to begin with, the show wasn't all that popular. Focus groups didn't really like it too much and although everyone praised the animation style, it was apparent that this wasn't created by a team whose sole purpose was to entertain kids. As these early test screens went on, it was also apparent that Nickelodeon was very scared about what was going to be aired. Just how do you market this show to kids? Especially when it was going up against things like Doug and Rugrats, and the end result was that Ren and Stimpy would get a slightly safer six episodes, and the other two more parent-pleasing cartoons would both get 13 episodes apiece. 
As production continued to move on, episodes got rejected or changed due to their content, and it ended up being an average of about two months before they finally got the green light from Nickelodeon to go ahead. And even then, once the stories were approved, a lot of the time the storyboard would be completely different, resulting in Nickelodeon holding back once again. But when that show did air, it did... Well, it did okay. It definitely didn't help that whilst other shows were running into their third week and beyond were all airing new episodes, Ren and Stimpy was already showing reruns, which really did drop its overall rating. John was an extreme perfectionist, and because of this, only three weeks in, the delays had already started to begin. However, when they did come in, those that actually watched them, loved them. And it was when Space Madness aired that everybody just got it. Space Madness. This was unlike any other show before it, and even though tensions constantly rose between Spumco and Nickelodeon, this was the perfect example of demonstrating what Ren and Stimpy was actually capable of. Sure, not every episode would be a psychodrama, as Nick put it, but it's safe to say that few others could ever pull off anything like this. Stimpy's invention was yet another huge landmark for the show, being incredibly delayed yet again, but as a result what we got was a truly iconic episode that most fans believed is one of the best. And yet, whilst all this was going on, it was still only just doing okay on the rating scale. That was until MTV picked it up and finally, it found its true audience. And that audience was? Well, it was everybody. Yeah, sure, kids would and do enjoy it, but Ren and Stimpy was something more. This was a show for all ages, something that doesn't happen too often. Not back then, at least. And from that moment on, not only did the show grow in popularity extremely quickly, but so did Nickelodeon too. And just as the second season was greenlit by a nervous, although no doubt very excited, Nickelodeon, this was even before season one had finished production, yep, Plenty of comics, toys, breakfast cereals, and of course, video games made their way to market. And although we still need to talk about the cancellation, the odd revival, the horrendous Kickstarter, and, uh, well, all that sexual misconduct stuff, I think now is a good time to chat about the games. Don't despair. Ren and Stimpy will be right back. Check it out. What is it, man? Only Nickelodeon can explode, implode, give a dog a log, or a baggy gritty kitty while the kitty's in the city with the mud skipper. Hippa, here's a cat without a nose. Pat a toast, man. Can you stand the insanity? No, sir, I don't like it. <laughs> it is I who am mad. You kidding, yak shaving, Dr. Stupid Robin Hook will have you singing happy, happy joy, joy boy. Yo, I'm talking about the one and only Ren and Stimpy show. On the only network for you. Nickelodeon. You're watching Nickelodeon, and now back to Ren and Stimpy. So to start off, let me just say with the Nicktoons brand being quite popular and very nostalgic, these two popped up several times in kart racing titles, sports titles, movie making titles, and random other shovelware too. But today we're going to be looking at the proper Ren and Stimpy video games of which there are quite a few. And best of all, for someone like me, they're on a crazy amount of different platforms too. Which should make this segment nice and interesting. So, to start off, we have Space Cadet Adventures for the original Game Boy released back in 1992. Ah, oh my god. Firstly, let's just look at how gorgeous this game is. So, it's a pretty generic platformer in all honesty. Stimpy accidentally cuts Ren's lifeline in space and you need to work your way through the level, dodging random projectiles along the way. It's actually not all that good, which sadly is a bit of a theme for this episode. And I think it goes about saying that John's reckless abandonment of deadlines in the name of quality is nowhere to be seen on this or on Buckaroo. This is a real assortment of levels that involve platforming and side-scrolling shooting. There's a puzzle platforming section in there too. And out of all the early Ren and Stimpy games, this one is probably the one that gets forgotten about the most. Heck, even when it was released for both the NES and the SNES, most gaming publications didn't even bother to review it. And when they did, it got average to below average scores across the board. The Super Nintendo version was easily the best to look at and play, 
But then again, that's not saying much. Moving on to 1993, we have the one that I <laughs> rented the most. Stimpy's Invention. In this one, you need to find all the missing items for Stimpy's blown up invention by traversing five levels found in the game. And for me, this game just wanted to be Earthworm Jim, a much better game and game series that I already covered. But sadly, it's not quite there. In fact, due to the wacky humor and even gameplay elements found throughout quite a few of these games, I can't help but think of Earthworm Jim multiple times. Sadly, not even in one instance is a game as good as those titles. Perhaps it's because I played this one as a kid and rented it multiple times, but so far this is my favourite of the bunch. It's not exactly easy, but it's not that impressive either. If you learn how to interact with every single thing that moves to make it to the end, then you will have an okay time playing this. I did, several times. It's not a game I ever cared enough to own, but it's good enough to rent in place of a packet of pick and mix or something. I suppose. Games like this are nothing more than a crash grab. Remember that episode when Ren pulled out the nerve endings behind his teeth? Yeah, put that in there. Sure, it makes no sense, but who cares? It's a reference, and that's all that the developers cared about. It might be worth playing if you have save states enabled and literally never stop using them, but once you finish it about 30 or 40 minutes later, I don't think it'll be worth much of any future playthroughs. THQ came back next with another title for the Super Nintendo, which featured a poster inside. And that was probably the highlight of owning this one. Yet again, it's crazily bare bones with only four levels based on the TV show. And yes, yet again, one of them is Stimpy's Invention. It's not a great game at all. And the Game Boy port is even worse. It's a simple platformer that again, you need to learn rather than enjoy. Dotted about each level a little ways on how to jump over or defend random enemy placements found throughout, and you really need to give the game plenty of trial and error before getting to grips on where everything is. Again, it's one of those games that if done correctly, may have actually ended up being rather good. Sadly, however, it's not. Okay, so your folks may act a little weird when they see you've got Stimpy's Invention, the new Ren and Stimpy game for Sega Genesis. So tell them it's the only game where Stimpy's Mutatomatic Invention explodes and warps the town, spreading giant flamingos and twisted lawnmowers everywhere. And you can be Ren or Stimpy, and team up for crazy cartoon powers like the Boomerang and Chopper Pilot. Hey, it's cooler than powdered toast, man. I just hope there's none of those disgusting hairballs. Stimpy's Invention, new for the Sega Genesis system, each sold separately. Thankfully, this is where the bad games ended, briefly, as the next one was yet again another Ren and Stimpy game that most people tend to forget about, however, it's actually quite the pleasant experience. Sure, it's not going to win any awards, but as simple platformers go on the Game Gear, you could do a lot worse. Its biggest downfall is that it's pretty damn repetitive. But still, it's probably the best so far besides the Mega Drive release, and in the current situation I'm in, well, I can't ignore that. I actually don't mind this one. Oh, and by the way, it did also make its way onto the Master System, but sadly only in Brazil. After this, THQ yet again had another stab at doing something with the license with probably the most well-known Ren and Stimpy game. Fire Dogs for the SNES. Yes, based on the episode of the same name that actually was what was referenced to as a cheetah cartoon, which was a cartoon made in an incredibly short amount of time when deadlines needed to be hit. It wasn't expected to be as popular as it was as the whole thing was written in about an hour. And this game is based on that episode. And my guess is that the game didn't take much longer to create either. It's literally two levels long, looped over once, and it's over. In the first level, you collect the bits needed to be on your way to fight fire. And in the second level, you collect falling objects from burning buildings. That is it. It's a boring as hell game. The falling objects level is to be fair okay, I suppose. Shout out to those Earthworm Gym similarities again. But the collecting item stuff is annoying as all hell. And that, like I said, is 50% of the game. I really do like this episode and its sequel too, but this is a horrifically tedious and hard, especially that first level game, to try and enjoy. Yep, I suppose I need to mention this now, don't I? 
the uh, Fire Dogs Ren and Stimpy LCD game. Yep, here it is. Not sure really what you want me to say about this. It covers the episode quite nicely, I suppose, and it plays okay. Doesn't really get very hard. Should we get back to the proper games? It's safe to say that THQ were publishing some pretty shoddy stuff here, but they still had one more game, and that game was Time Warp. Ugh, guys, I'm sorry to say, but this could possibly be the worst. When you fail at just getting through a fence at the beginning of the game, you know you're in for a bad time. Again, plenty of trial and error is the key here. Sure, having random mosquitoes chasing you and performing the happy, happy, joy, joy song are all things, you know, that happen in the show, but it's completely out of context in this game. Yet again, another licensed product made to simply earn a quick buck, no matter how good the game was, and, you know, this one just wasn't. Uh, in all fairness, I suppose this is the longest of the four games, and at least it does mix it up a bit. But seriously, who here wants an asteroids ripoff where you shoot logs? Does that sound good to you? <laughs> seriously, you know, logs, they're in the show, so put them in the game. It's just absolutely pointless, and it really is such a shame that such a beloved property was so badly treated by THQ. Now, before moving on to the last few games, I think it's probably worth catching everybody up to speed with what was going on by this point in the life of Ren and Stimpy outside of video games. Even though it has and still does have a cult following, the relationship between Nickelodeon and John K got worse and worse, mainly due to the sheer amount that Nickelodeon wanted to censor in each episode. Plus, on top of this, the approval process according to John K was extremely long-winded. And before you know it, by the end of Season 2, all communication between the two companies was made via John's legal representatives. It was only going to end in a disaster by this point, and it did as this led to the creation of the episode Man's Best Friend, which Nickelodeon downright refused to air, and John was eventually fired from his own show. He was offered the role of consultant on Ren and Stimpy, but as you would expect, he refused to accept it. And this left Ren and Stimpy in the hands of Games Animation, which would eventually become Nickelodeon Animation Studio, and most people believe that this was the downfall for the series, and well, I kind of agree. There are without a doubt some funny episodes in those final few seasons, but the drop of quality was obviously evident, that's for sure. And it was finally dropped completely from Nickelodeon on December 16th, 1995. And that was the end of Ren and Stimpy. Well, until 2002, when Spike TV, who was creating some adult oriented cartoons, contacted John asking him to revive the classic series, but for an adult audience. Thus, Ren and Stimpy Adult Party Cartoon was born, another six episodes were greenlit, and it was heavily advertised. The hype was real with this one, and it lasted one month before being removed completely, locked in a vault, and never spoken about again by Spike TV. Come to Spike TV, the first network for men. A blast from the past. Get out! We're back! It's not the same old crap. Smells like home. It's new crap. You idiot! Ren and Stimpy's all-new adult party cartoon premieres Thursday at 10 p.m. on Spike TV. <laughs> now. I'm not going to lie, I actually don't mind these episodes, I've watched them a few times over, but the biggest problem with it for me is that the fact that these shows are just far too long winded for what they are. Slapstick jokey shows like this work in a nice 11 minute setting, 2 per 20 minute ish episode set up, but these are completely stretched out, and some parts that might make you chuckle just go on and on way too much for their own good. But the real issue here is the fact that these cartoons originally had boundaries in the Nickelodeon days, and that was kind of fun seeing how Spumco tried to push those boundaries. But this, well, this is what happens when you put those characters in a no boundary limit setup. And in my opinion, it feels like they're still trying to break these imaginary borders, even though they kind of don't exist in the first place, which basically results in jokes removed and replaced with swear words and scat. 
Again, I actually quite like what they did and in hindsight, I'm actually happy this didn't go any further than six episodes because I know that would have found it just as annoying as everybody else seems to. Because these final six episodes gave Ren and Stimpy a really bad name. And that's such a shame. All those years of personally defending John and wanting to stick it to the man for getting in the way of creative freedom or whatever, all of a sudden started to fall apart. Seeing what would happen if John really did what he wanted without any or at least hardly any boundaries or limits started to become apparent. And although I will still hold those first two seasons near and dear to my heart, little did I know that the worst was yet to come. But first... Let's look at a couple more games, shall we? Firstly, you have a standard pinball game made for phones in 2004, because, you know, why not? And then we got a few browser-based games too, such as Ren and Stimpy's Crazy Cannon, and again, that one's actually not too bad. And Robin Hoek is a simple, basic, and a little less fun if you ask me. Both of these ones were released in 2007. And finally, in 2011, you have Mouthtrap, which I'm not going to lie, this one's actually not too bad at all. The cartoon's finished, Ren. Would you like to see it? The legacy of Ren and Stimpy is strong and I hope it stays that way. It pushed boundaries with its gross humour, influenced endless amounts of animators with its incredibly unique art style, which is so obvious when you see it animation wise and storyboard comedic writing wise, and overall I just couldn't be happier with the show. The games however, yeah take them or leave them. And with the birth of the internet, it became easier for people like me to follow more closely their animation idols, such as John Kay on places like his own blog, as well as plenty of animation discussion groups in forums that chatted about him constantly. And there's no denying that this guy was, and to some degree still is, a legend. A legend that was hard done by by the man up top. Although, when looking a little deeper perhaps, John wasn't as hard done by as originally expected. Perhaps he was incredibly hard to work with, and perhaps the delays really were as bad as the man made out. Which sadly, all of us hardcore fans got to experience first hand. But, we'll get to that next time. Hey there guys, thanks for checking out the video. Yes, 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 I've cut this sort of into two. I feel like this video is very much the complete uh, history in the games, complete history, whatever, of Ren and Stimpy, whereas the next one's going to be very much focused on the whole Kickstarter and everything else that happened to uh, John K during that time uh, disaster. Yeah, I feel like they need to be two separate videos. But yes, anyway, I want to give a big shout out to the person that helped out by providing his voice, Mr. She Says. Yes, a great channel that you should all go and check out. There will be a link below in the description. Uh, and also, yes, a big shout out to this video sponsor, Player One Clothing. Be sure to go over to his website where you can go and get plenty of your movie and gaming related garments for your wardrobe and make it all really nice and awesome. I don't even know what I'm talking about now. So what I will say is if you like any of the games that you're seeing on the screen, there'll be affiliate links below that really 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 do help the show please do go and check them out and use the code SGR at the checkout if you want to get a little bit of money off but anyway yeah let's get over to those patreons with a big special shout out going to Gary Pinkett that retro video gamer Mantis Ryan Burford Andrew Dalton Ben Jackson Jonathan Haywood Christopher Turnbull Phil Lowlands Tomic Rabowski Mr. Vestek Retro to Next Gen Hawk89 Dina Robertson Dunn Lefty Intrigued Gaming Abby Morris Tim Labonte Asobi Quang DX, Tim Lunn, Hernanaz, Pixels.Limited, aka Samuel Victor, Red the Beard, Conrad Constantine, Pretendo64, Creamy Elephant, Casey Garner, Blitz Hedgy, King Link Reviews, Gemma at Mr. T's Shirt, Dan Petit, Primetime Penny Sleeve, Mike H. Fell, Lucas Softel, Ye Old Hamburglar, Gregory Arden, Ronnie Method, SSWB, Solid Captor, Jeremy Rodriguez, Nick Pollard, Bram Perez, Marcus King, Emo Cut Tindall, June the Geeky Dad, Richard Carter, aka Fantastic Dizzy, Todd Paul Float, G Petty Mew and Blue Right. 
If you want to get your name shouted out, get your name shown, come see what I'm working on, and, be, you know, be part of the exclusive rooms in the Discord channel, come see all these crazy updates I do over on Patreon, and, well, there's plenty of other awesome perks over there too, then, you know, click the link that you see on the screen. You can join the channel via YouTube by clicking below for that. And, um, yeah, I don't know what, go and find me on social media channels, everything else, like, comment, subscribe, all of that usual YouTube jargon, because now... Well, for now, guys, it's DJ Slope signing out, and hopefully I'll see you all next time.